tell me about Moses? Who was Moses? Anybody? Okay, give me some give me some facts about Moses. Maybe in a basket. Okay, remember that, right? What else did he do? Raised by Pharaoh's daughter. Parted the Red Sea. Let the children of Israel out of Egypt. There we go. Good stuff, right? Burning bush. Burning bush. There we go. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so I got one. I got one. He didn't really stutter. And then I got another that goes, he stuttered. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. Now, here's the thing is, w- would you, okay, would it be fair to say that Moses did a lot of incredible things in the Bible? Yeah. His story, right? Yeah. Now, he wrote the first five books of the Bible, which are called the Pentateuch, right? He wrote those because he lived those. Now, Moses did some great things. He had a great calling, right? Yeah. I mean, he had an amazing calling. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about Moses today and how Moses' life really looks like our life and how he went through the same things that we're going through daily. But there's three things that Moses had to overcome. We call them three, Moses' three hills or Moses' three obstacles or whatever you want to call it. But we're going to talk about just three things in specific, right? Now, starts in Exodus. Exodus 4, verse 1 through wherever I finish, all right? <laughs> then Moses answered and said... But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. Talking about God, right? So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Think about that. It turns into a snake. He's like, ah, it runs from the snake. (laughs) This is Moses we're talking about, right? Right. Okay. (laughs) I always get that picture in my head. All right. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. I think, remember, he was scared of this thing. Reach out your hand, take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said, now put your hand in your bosom. And when he put his hand in his bosom and we took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river, pour it on dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. Now, most of you are probably familiar with that story, right? We've heard that growing up, children's church, which we need to really get our children's church going because this is important. Most of the stuff I learned in the Bible was in children's church. Yes. Coloring those pictures, you know, Moses in the basket. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. So anyway, we really need to get that going. That's why this building is so important for us. Mm-hmm. We need room to have classrooms. And so that's why our vision is, is it's not small. And we're going to continue, right, Janice? All right. Amen. Eldon, you elbow her if you need to. Okay, sounds good. All right. Now, anyone seen the movie? Remember Charlton Heston standing up with those tablets yes. on the mountain? And used to show it every Easter. I don't even know if they'll allow it on TV now. Every year we'd watch it. It was always so good. I just liked watching that. But, so, let's go over a little bit of the background of that story just in case, okay? So, it actually starts in chapter 3. I'll back up a little bit. Moses is standing on Mount Horeb, and God first appeared to him in the burning bush. Now, in that moment, as we enter into chapter 4, God is presenting himself to Moses and saying, I want you to represent me. I want you to go into Egypt. Now, this is where Moses is called to do what God has asked. This is where his calling is. And for those of you that have a calling and have have experienced a calling, this is where Moses gets his, all right? And we're going to talk about that. It's a supernatural way. It's an amazing way. He's talking to him in a burning bush. Think about that. But we see Moses hesitating in that moment when God is talking to him. That hesitation rises up in him, that doubt, right? Now, don't hold his feet to the fire just yet, pardon the pun, all right? Moses has some concerns, okay? He's full of doubt. God, 
what it, what's going to happen is God has to deal with three barriers right here that Moses is going to face. God has to deal with this in a way so that Moses understands his calling and how important it is that he fulfill that. All right? One thing I really want you to get from this today is I want you to take time to consider whether um, these obstacles that Moses is facing here are in your lives, your daily lives. Doing what God has asked you to do. I want you to understand. I want you to think about these three, th these three things and see if you understand these, all right? Now, possibly we've fallen back on some of these same excuses in our ministry. So we need to, we need to really watch ourselves. So the first obstacle. It's the first thing that Moses asked God in this verse, all right? He says, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe me? Now, I want you to notice something interesting here. Because, okay, so God told Moses in the preceding chapter, he's going to be sent to Egypt to free his people, right? He, he's going to confront Pharaoh, right? Now listen, this is the biggest, strongest army on earth at the time. And God's saying, you're going to go confront Pharaoh. You're going to go free my people, right? Pharaoh's not, God's telling him, Pharaoh's not going to want to let his people go, okay? And God's telling him there's going to be a fight, there's going to be curses, uh, it's going to be a very, very difficult struggle to get these people out, right? So God has already laid all this out for Moses. Pharaoh's not going to listen to you. What do you think Moses' first concern would be? Think about this huge army. Pharaoh. I mean, he's got all the power he wants. Wouldn't that be your first concern? But Moses' first concern was, they won't listen to me. He's talking about his own people. He's not even concerned about Pharaoh and the army and all that stuff. He's more concerned about what if my own people won't listen to me. So that's the first thing that rises up in him. So that's interesting to me. I, I thought it was. But in a way it makes sense because he, Moses pretty much already knows that, you know, that the Egyptians are going to fight him. That they're, they're not going to do this. So, yeah, I mean, they're going to object. You know, hey, let my people go. Uh, yeah, right. You know, they're the one making all our bricks with all this mud and hay, you know, right? We're not going to let them go. So he already knows that that's going to do it. So he's basically saying, God, what if no one accepts me as your representative? Right? He's, he's thinking, okay, I'm supposed to go represent you. I'm supposed to stand in front of all these people and say, hey, guys, listen, I'm here to free you. Right? So he's got all these doubts coming up. Isn't that the way we feel sometimes, honestly, in ministry? You know, when I received my calling, I remember thinking, who's going to listen to me? Why would they listen to me? And so that's what Moses is going through. You know, what if they don't agree that I have your power behind me? Mm. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And these are regular, these are everyday things that as you go out and minister... You know, these things we think about all the time. Why would they listen to me? I've done this. I've done that. Right? right? Just being transparent. So Moses right now is pretty down. He's starting to really say, oh, well, what if they won't listen to me? What if they won't allow me? What if they won't understand I'm representing you, right? So God calls everyone to serve in ministry. Everyone. Every one of you are called to serve in ministry. Yeah. All right? Everyone in this room has been called to serve. Amen. But we have to hear God about the specifics. That's right. <laughs> now, it doesn't keep you from serving. I mean, you should all be willing to, you know, like, hey, listen, I'll serve any capacity. Now, we hear that a lot. You know, oh, yeah, whatever you want, let me do it. And you ask them to do it, and they're like, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> and, and I'm not slamming anyone. I'm just saying that's usually the way it is, right? We have to hear God on the specifics. Let me, let me give you a test real quick. So if you came to church, let's say you came here for church one day, and let's say uh, Pastor Darren here, you know, asked someone. He's sitting there right by the coffee maker, and someone walks by, and he goes, hey, would you make me a cup of coffee? You're in church. You go, oh, yeah, Pastor Darren, sure thing. I'll do it, even though Darren's sitting a chair away from it, right? <laughs> Now, let me ask you this. They would do that in church. I'm telling you, they would do that. Absolutely. But let's go home, and let's say your spouse is sitting about a chair away from the coffee pot, and you go, hey, could you make me a cup of coffee? Like, 
you were. Come on. Is your, is your hand broke? So is that really? And, and I'm not getting on anybody. I'm just saying. I'm trying not to look down. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Is that really a servant's heart? Is that a cheap imitation? Because you're in church. And someone sees you. Oh, yeah, sure, pastor. I'll do this for you. You want your car washed? You know. But if we go home and we act differently toward our spouse, our family, someone else, because just because they're close enough, I think it's a cheap imitation. I think you really don't have a servant's heart. I think you want to be seen as a servant. There's a change that happens when you truly want to serve the kingdom. Guess what? Everyone here is in the kingdom. So what, what would it matter? You know, there's a lot of damage in our lives that only God can fix. And once we give it to him, you know, he can fix those things. And I'm more than happy. I mean, I'm leaving the other day. I got my hands full. I'm doing something. I'm walking out. And she goes, can you make me a cup of coffee? And I, I, I'm just being honest here because it makes me look good right now. So, <laughs> it, and I did. I said, sure, absolutely. Put all this stuff down. Had the dog over my shoulder, oh. dragging dog food. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, my poor back. <laughs> Can you make me some coffee? I'm like, okay. <laughs> but, check yourself. Check your heart. Amen. What's your motives? What's your motivation? We have to hear God on the specifics, right? Yes. Paul says we are to present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God because that is our spiritual act of worship or service to God. In other words, we're not saved for our own sake, right? God didn't look down from heaven and say, you know what? Heaven wouldn't be heaven without Pastor Stephen. He didn't say that. God doesn't need us. That's right. If I choose not to do what he's asked me to do, he will find someone else. Right. He's giving us an opportunity. That's right. So you get a choice. You have free will. He's not going to break his own rules. He's given you the chance. He's given you an opportunity. He's not saving us so that we get something out of the process. That's not why he's saving us. He saved us for his glory. Because he is worthy. He is worthy. I'm so thrilled to be able to do what he's asked us to do. Now, do we do it perfectly? No. But we do our best. And we stick to the word. And we stay on that, that path. And we fellowship together so we can help each other stay on that path. We need fellowship. There's people sitting at home today because they are too tired to get up and get out of bed. And that was me for years. I thought, you know what, I can do something. I'll read a book later. You know what, I'll, I'll read a chapter in the Bible later. How about that? You cannot replace the fellowship. Amen. Amen. We, get to, we get to love on each other. We get to hug each other. We get to, you know, just lay hands on each other. It's those people that need it. We all need it. Amen. We are all called into ministry. So... As Rebecca and I talk about stuff, people we've met, things we've been through, we meet people all the time who equate ministry with a professional career or a professional calling, okay? And, and yeah, I mean, they're compatible. Um, scripture says, yeah, if you're doing the work of God, you should be compensated for that if it's your professional calling. Everyone here is called to ministry, right? That's right. We understand that? It's a valid concept that you do receive compensation for doing this. It's, it's, it's biblical, absolutely. But it's not a necessary one. That's right. It's not an obligation. It's yes. not a requirement. So in other words, it doesn't excuse the rest of us. Amen. So if we're not getting paid for it, we shouldn't use that as an excuse That's not right. to be in ministry, right. to do our ministry. And here's something I'm going to tell you. Some, some of you may not understand, but I'm sure most of you will get this. The Bible is pretty clear on this. Pastors are not in ministry. Hear me out. Pastors are not in ministry. Evangelists are not in ministry. 
worship singers, musicians, Bible teachers, counselors, anyone who is an official representative of corporate church, they're not in ministry. They're simply one of the body doing their personal ministry. Some get paid for it. Some do not. So, there's no such thing as normal people who are not in ministry. We all have a ministry. And in Ephesians 4.11 it says, He himself gave some to be apostles. Remember this? Mm -hmm. Some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And then look what it says the reason for this is. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So those offices I just listed aren't in the ministry. They're there to equip the body for the work of the ministry. Yes. You get it? Yeah. Good. The word for service here, which basically is for equipping for everyone else for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. That's what the, the pastors, apostles, teachers, right? Evangelists. We, we, that's what that's for, to equip everyone else for ministry, to do the ministry, right? So, and, and I thought this was interesting. The word service here is diakonia in Hebrew. It literally, it, it, I'm sorry, Greek, it means ministry, service ministry. The definition of the word ministry is to serve. That's what ministry is, to serve. The reason we have pastors, the reason we have people in counseling positions or teaching positions is not so they can do ministry. It's exactly the opposite. They exist so that you will do ministry. You come here today to listen so you can do ministry. That's right. That's good. You have to understand that. People are so, oh, you know, listen, they're in the ministry full time. That's, and people say it all the time. But if you really break it down into this, you're in the ministry full time. And we're just here to equip you for that. It's a calling on us. Right. Just like you have your calling to be in ministry. And as you progress, you will define that and see where you fit in that, where he has asked you to be specifically. It's so interesting. All right. When we receive the call in our life, now, and, and let's clarify this, the call on your life doesn't mean you have to go to the other side of the world and live in a hut. Although it could. Most people we talk to are like, oh yeah, I don't want to go to Africa. <laughs> Definitely don't want to go to Afghanistan. What if it's your call? <laughs> you know, I, after being in Iraq and losing some soldiers and being injured and all of those things, I did not want to go to Iraq. I hated Iraqis. Just being honest. It took God to change that in my life to where you can ask Rebecca. I started thinking, I wonder how I could get back there and minister to those people. But that wasn't my particular call. Now, I'm telling you, something you hate very much, all of a sudden you start really wanting to go, that's God. Amen. That's God. He'll give you the grace to do that. So, just saying, please don't ever, ever say never. Yes. Done that five times, all five times, guess what? Thanks, God. Your call might be how you live your life, and it probably is in your own home. Ministry starts in your home. Amen. It could be the way you live your life at school or at work. That could be your call right now. So, he's basically saying, when, when you receive that call, I have gifted you. I have appointed you. Here's the work I have for you. This is what his call is for you. But when we hear that, honestly, our first thought might be like Moses. Remember Moses, his first thought? God, who would receive me? Who would listen to me? Who in God's people would ever look to me and say, you know, you know, Stephen, I think you have something that's worth listening to. You know, and these are true things that go through your mind. These are true things you have to overcome by stepping out in faith on what God has asked you to do. If you never take that step, you'll never know. God will find someone else. You have to understand, it's going to be uncomfortable. 
I don't know whoever said that you were going to not be sick, that it was going to be so comfortable. He's going to lay this trail of money in front of you, and you just follow the dollar bills and pick them up. I've heard people talk about that before. No. But where he does call you, that's where your provision lies. So, you know, I even wrote down a note, Stephen, you have something that actually could be a benefit to me that could serve me in ministry. You know, people are thinking that. Who could do that? Who would ever think I could serve in God's name? And you know what the true answer to that is? No one. No one, nor should they. So why am I here? Why do I have anything to offer? And this is what Moses is going through his head. I can just read that. As I was thinking and praying this, I wrote these notes down. I could just see that going through his head. You know, who would think I have anything to offer? You know, and, and you know, one thing God didn't do was come down and go, oh, it's okay, Moses. They're going to love you. That's right. They're going to think you're awesome. <laughs> You're so, you're so handsome. You look just like Charlton Heston. <laughs> you know, that's not what God did. He didn't come up and butter him up. He didn't come up and go, yeah, come on, you got this. You've been trained in Pharaoh's court. You went to the best seminary. You had the best professors. You've written all these books. You've got the degrees. You're ready. They'll accept you. God didn't do that. But you know what? That's what men do. That's what men do. We tend to look at someone's pedigree. You know, oh, what, do you, what letters do you have after your name? Which school did you go to? That's what men tend to do. Moses couldn't have met that test. We couldn't meet that test. Most of us, right? God told Moses, I will validate your ministry. Let me show you how. In verse 2, he says, I want you to take your staff. Now, he does the whole snake thing, right, which is really famous. Everyone loves that scene. And, uh, and he really says, I will prove your calling by the work of your hands. What you can do in your hands, how I appoint your hands in your body of work, I will appoint you to do things that validate your ministry by the work of your hands, is what God's telling Moses. That's why he said, take the staff, throw it on the ground, pick it up. So he's validating his work with his hands. I will make your life a living sacrifice to me. People will know me by looking at you and your life by the way your life has become a mirror of mine. Wow. Think about that. So the work of your hands, the rod, verse 6 he says, the hand and the bosom, you know, remember that? Goes in, comes out leprous, goes back in, comes out normal. So what he's saying there is, I will approve, I will validate once again your calling. In verse 9, God tells Moses he's going to turn the Nile into blood if it comes to it. So what he's saying is, I'm going to validate your authority. So all of these things that Moses, he's asking Moses to do, he says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to back you up. So if, I, if he's going to validate your calling, he's going to validate it by the results of your ministry and by the fruit of what it is that you do. That's good. So you have to line those things up. If he, if he calls you to ministry, he's going to validate your ministry. And then when you're in your ministry, guess what? He's going to validate that ministry by the fruit of what you're doing. We see people saved in here. We see people set free from here. We see people go through counseling and take ginormous steps in their lives, their personal lives, and their relationships. That is fruit from what God has asked us to do. He set us in this position to be able to help in ways you have never been able to be helped before. Maybe it's the way uh, you meet someone and the Holy Spirit goes, you know what, you can talk to them. And then when you get in there and talk to them, the Holy Spirit goes, you know what, I've never seen it that way. You know, it's saying that inside of you. And that's usually the way it works because you've stepped out in faith, followed the guidance of the Holy Spirit, which he's supposed to lead us. And that's how change, our life begins to change. And we step into the role he made us to be. But you have to be willing you have to be willing. By the work you do, 
This is the three things in our life, by the work you do, by the effort, and the kinds of effect you have on people. Do people just run from you when they meet you? Like, oh, God, I don't want to talk to them. Hey, man, take a bath. You know? But when you meet someone and you see Jesus in them, you're instantly attracted to them. Because you know that you have the same thing inside of you and that he's trying to do a work in your life and he's trying to reach you every way possible. And what is the fruit of that? What is the output? How does that come to bear in our lives? God says, I'll validate your ministry. I'll prepare to do that for you, Moses. I will validate your ministry. Just don't think about what you can do. Think about what I can do. It's not about you. It's about God and what God can do in your life. If you've been gifted, if you've been called, you have a ministry to do. You have a ministry to do. Now, it's just a matter of if you are going to do it. If you're going to do it. You can't point to your lack of qualifications as an excuse for not serving God's people. That's right. Amen. Amen. Who are... Okay, so let's talk about Amos. The prophet Amos. I don't know if any of you read that book. But Amos was a sheep herder. He made a living raising sheep in the southern kingdom of Judah. One day he gets a call from God to go to the northern kingdom, which was an enemy of the southern kingdom. So he gets this call from God as a sheep herder. Go to the north where the enemy's waiting there. Right? Now, he prophesied against King Jeroboam. God called him to go prophesy against the king, his enemy, right? Amos shows up as a nobody, a sheep herder. No professional background in ministry, no rabbinical training, and he starts to prophesy against the king of the kingdom. And so the priests of that kingdom call him out, and they say, you are a nobody. We don't want to listen to you. Who are you to come tell us this? So look at Amos' response. Amos 7, verse 14. Amos replied, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet. I'm a herdsman, a grower of sycamore figs. And then he said, but the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people, Israel. I love that. And that's what he's doing for you. It's not about your, your, your pedigree. It's not about who your mom and dad was. It's about who you are in Christ. And he's going to use you if you let him. I'm not here because I'm special. I'm here because God called me. What about lack of ability? I just can't do it. I don't know how to do it. Is that a good reason not to serve? What about my ability? Look at verse 10 and uh, we're still in. Exodus. Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past. Now, listen, I love what he's saying. He's not a very good speaker, and it's, he's not getting any better. <laughs> he says, Nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Verse 11, The Lord said to him, Who made me your mouth? Basically, I'm paraphrasing. Who makes mute or deaf or seeing blind? It is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be your mouth and teach you what to say. And then Moses said, please, Lord, now send the messenger by whomever you will, after the Lord said that to him. This made the Lord mad. How do I know that? Because it says the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. Think about that. And the Lord said, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? The Levite? I know that he speaks fluently, and more ever, behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and to put the words in his mouth, and I, even I, will be your mouth, and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he will speak to you, to speak to you, to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. You shall take in your hand his staff, which you shall perform the signs. So, Moses' hesitation about answering God's call was lessened. So his objections basically move from his authority now to his ability. So he keeps looking for ways not to do what he's supposed to do. It's a concern about his ability. 
So, Moses describes himself as slow of speech and slow of tongue, and basically saying, I'm not eloquent, literally. In the Hebrew, it means I'm not, I'm a, I'm not a man of speech. When he says I'm slow of speech, it, it means I have a heavy mouth. So, I know some of you, you know, we're talking about him stuttering, and, and I've heard that a lot. Um, I don't know if he had a speech impediment. Honestly, I, I think what he's really trying to say is that, you know, I'm just, I don't think well on my feet. That when I speak, I, I'm not as eloquent as most people. Because the reason I say that is because it's easy for us to put ourselves in his shoes and say, you know what, if I were there, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have hesitated because I'm not a stutterer. So what I think has happened is he's just saying, I'm heavy mouth, which means I, it's difficult for me to get points across the way I'd like to. So when we put ourselves in his shoes, I'm not sure he was a stutterer. I've heard both sides. I'm just saying, I don't believe he was. And there's good points <laughs> to both sides of that. But the point is, don't think that because he had this problem, that's the reason that he doubted. The reason he doubted is because he doubted, just like we do. So it, it, it's, it's the natural doubt. It's not the unnatural doubt. So think about this. Like when we're at church and we try to get someone to help out, right? Someone says, hey, I need you to help with the children's church or children's ministry. What's well, the first thing someone says? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not good with kids. You know what? Do you, I mean, do you hold them under water or do you throw them out of the window? <laughs> Can you watch them for 30 minutes? You know, not that big a deal, right? You know, I'm not that good with kids. What? You know, I had a guy in basic training. And we we're going to the rifle range. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. I can't shoot a gun. Right? What? Join the army. You know, <laughs> what were you thinking? They're going to have you. Anyway. <sighs> All right. I need, I need someone to help with the men's ministry. You know, oh, well, I really wouldn't know how to do that. You know, we're like, well, can, can you help clean up? can set up chairs. Can you do that? Thankfully, our church, we have people that respond to that all the time. People are like, oh, yeah, I'll do it all the time. Eldon was like, yeah, I'll, whatever, I need to, whatever you need me to do. That's awesome. That's a servant's heart right there. Amen. So, sometimes people do that just out of sheer laziness. Mm. You're right. They just don't want to do it. But sometimes they're really concerned because they're afraid they won't be able to do a good job. And that's a legitimate doubt. It's a natural response. Yeah, and Moses, that was, that was his thing. He was worried about his ability. He didn't feel like he was able to do, to keep up to the immensity of the task that God has asked him to do with Pharaoh in Egypt. And he's right. He didn't have what it took. He didn't. Not even close. Because if his thought was, listen, I'm going to go into Egypt and I'm going to woo Pharaoh and I'm going to get what I want through my words, guess what? He's going to be a miserable failure. Miserable failure because he didn't have what it takes. None of us do. God does. Yes. Right. God does. So, first thing he says to Moses about that is who made your mouth? God. Is it not I the Lord? Right? So, he's the one that crafted us for a purpose. He made you for something specific. It's his perfect workmanship. God doesn't make lemons. Well, he does. He makes lemons, but he doesn't make <laughs> lemons. <laughs> right, <Amen>. okay. <laughs> and I want you to understand something. It's God that does it through us. It's not us that, it's not of our own volition. It's not us that, that, that willingly. It's God through us. When we let ourselves be his receptacle, when we, he uses our mouth and our hands, it's God. Now, it's not just when we speak before a king either. It's when we speak to our kids. If we accomplish any of these things with our kids, whatever, we have to give God the credit because we're listening to the Lord to be able to communicate. It had to be through him that made it possible. It's easy to take credit when there's a small job. Oh, yeah. That's fine. But it's God. It's the big things. You need something big like, oh, give credit. It's God. God did it all. It's one of those things. Listen, it's always God. Yes, that's right. It's always God that does it through us if we allow him to do that. 
Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. We're always thinking we're in control, but we're never in control. It's always God. We like to think we're in control, but we're not. You know? And secondly, God says to Moses, I'm going to raise up others. So he sends Aaron, sends his brother, right? Listen, the provision that we need to get through life isn't always just money. It's people. Amen. It's help. Yes. It's not about you, Moses. It's about what I'm asking you to do. Yes. And think about this. Moses just happened to be heavy of mouth, worried about his mouth. And it just so happens he sent him a brother who was very eloquent of speech. What a coincidence, right? No, it's not a coincidence. God had it planned out. He had it planned out just like he has it planned out for you. I've given you all you need to do what I've asked you to do. So, now, Exodus 4, verse 18. Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they're still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Remember, Moses killed a guy. Yeah. So then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. But if you refu refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And it came to pass on, that way, on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of their son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Now, I told you we were talking about three barriers for Moses, right? The first one was Moses doubted that his calling would be acceptable to the people. The second was Moses had doubts concerning his ability to do that. So, this next one is a new one. It's an issue of obedience and devotion to God's call. Verse 19, God tells Moses, it's time for you to go back to Egypt. The time has come. All your adversaries have died. Moses takes part in the movement back to Egypt. And in verse 24, we get to one of the most mysterious passages in, in, in the Bible. Now, this is a verse that most people really think about and and. and I know that people are swayed one way rather than the other. So I want to talk a little bit about that real quick. So in Hebrew, the Hebrew language does not contain pronouns. So it does not contain pronouns. So there is no him, he, or she, or anything like that. So whenever it, it's, we're speaking about someone, it's by implication that we understand who they're talking about. And you'll understand what I'm talking about here in a second. So. We're trying to guess who the verse is talking about. The Lord has met him and sought to put him to death. Okay? So, in the original Hebrew, it does not have those pronouns. So, it basically says the Lord encountered and sought to take life. That is the best way to, to define that verse. The Lord encountered and sought to take life. That's the most literal way we can take it. So, Moses is traveling. He's got his wife Zipporah, a woman he married while he was in Midian which is right, basically, common, you know, uh, modern-day Saudi Arabia, okay? Now, we know that he's traveling uh, with two sons, and they come in the, at this point in their travel, God has met him in an angry way. So God is angry as they're traveling, and it's clear that he's unhappy. It's because at least one of the two boys has not been circumcised, okay? All Jews were bound by covenant given to Abraham to be circumcised the eighth day, and that's uh, Genesis 17, verse 10. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And if you skip down to verse 14, it says, And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So, 
The word there for cut off literally means cut, but it also means destroyed or killed. All right? So I believe the meaning here is that the one who would not be circumcised is to be put to death. So when God confronts Moses here, he's angered, we're, we're told, because Moses has not obeyed the commandment to circumcise his son. Many say it was Moses himself who was going to be killed. Many believe that. But we can't tell for sure because of the Hebrew pronouns, but I think it was actually the son. Because the penalty of death was given in Genesis 17 to the one who wasn't circumcised, not the one who didn't do the circumcision. All right? The penalty for being uncircumcised is the person that would be cut off. So that seems to me that would indicate that's the son's life. And it's also interesting that God had just finished telling Moses what he was going to have to tell Pharaoh when he gets to Egypt. He's given Moses a preview of what's coming, and it's interesting he chose to give Moses a picture of. He didn't talk about all the plagues. He didn't talk about the process leading up to the plagues. He focused on the last one. He tells him the firstborn child of Pharaoh is going to be cut off, that he's going to be killed because of Pharaoh's disobedience to my word. Now, Moses was confronted by God shortly, after, uh, shortly thereafter for disobedience to God's word. Mm -hmm. The penalty would be comparable, similar. Same message to Moses. One of your sons is in penalty now for disobedience. Now, honestly, I can't prove that it was Moses' son, but I'm saying it, 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 it lines up. It, it sounds correct. I mean, I don't even think that's important. That it's, what I'm, what's important is Moses is in jeopardy for disobedience to God's word because God was angry, failing to obey God's commandment. So here's what I think happened. Moses' wife, Zipporah, not a Jewish woman, not used to Jewish custom, and I'm sure Moses went to her and said, hey, this is our belief. This is our, what we do on our eight, eighth day. We've got to circumcise our son. They had their first son. She witnessed it. And goes, oh my goodness, I don't want anything to do with that anymore. So then they had their second son, and she said, no, we are not doing that to my son. Because they had one son that was not circumcised. So, here's a man appointed to lead God's people, the nation of Israel, out of captivity to represent them, to represent God before Pharaoh, a man who's supposed to come and demand Pharaoh's obedience and ultimately de demand the nation of Israel's obedience to the covenant. And he hasn't even done what God has asked him to do. Think about that. How can a man who doesn't command obedience in his own household command you to do God's will? That's the big thing. 1 Timothy chapter 3, he's talking about, Paul's talking about qualifications for elders in the church. He says, if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Yes. That's pretty convincing, right? Yes. Hmm. If we're not willing to exercise leadership among those closest to it, how can we, how can we follow someone that doesn't take care of their own house? He's asking a whole nation of Israel to follow him, and his son hadn't even been circumcised. Since it's, it's a pretty simple concept, right? I really believe God applied that here to Moses. If you will not do what I've asked, I'm not going to see you as a suitable representative. And that's something we need to think about in ministry. The problem is, or what's troubling is, when God makes this clear to Moses, and we don't know the details, but I'm telling you, this is, in my opinion, this is what he's dealing with. Who solves the problem? Not Moses. Zipporah. Knowing her child is in je jeopardy, she takes a stone and circumcises the child and throws it at Moses. Why would she do that? I mean, we're, it, it, I told you that's one of the most mysterious passages in the Bible because no one understands that. It makes perfect sense. In anger, she throws it at Moses. It's a sign of her disconsent. It's a sign of her anger. 
And I believe Moses was brought to this point because he didn't hear. He wasn't heeding to God's call. He hadn't taken care of his own house yet. And he's supposed to be on the way to, to, to gather the nation of Israel and free him. God validates our ministry, and we have to understand it's in his power that gives us hope to do that. We have to conform our own life to God's commandments before he is able to do anything in our lives in a mighty way, in our ministry. If we don't get our lives in order, we are not going to be able to do mighty things of God in, in, in the body, in the church, in the ministry, whatever. We have to line up those things. We have to trust God for our ability because it's him, not us, right? We have to get our house straight. Are you going to church all the time and praising God and praying and worshiping and doing all that? And then you go home and you cuss like a sailor. Or you don't live a life that is, you know, worthy for God to go, hey, listen, I'm going to put you in charge. You're going and taking this whole, this, whole, this whole group of people and I want you to lead them out. Right? You're like, okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. After I go home and get on the internet and watch pornography, and I'm not making light of that. That's a real issue. Yes. I've had pastors come to me asking for prayer because they've been in ministry 30 some odd years and can't stop pornography. And it's cost them two relationships. So we need to get our houses in order. Yes. 